fact that, like, this is a big discussion that, you know, this all took place during Katrina. You know, so people were in New Orleans, you know, like, I mean, what if, like, people educated in, you know, getting along faced a huge crisis? What would happen then? You know, what are the possibilities for self-organizing then? And that's kind of... I was just going to say that maybe you guys want to introduce yourselves. Maybe I should set up this whole event. Yeah. My name is Norman. I'm one of the people who are here. Also, you're a writer for... Oh, yes. And a writer for reality sound. Not at all. On the panels and with other people. It's great to select their cell and post cards at the front so you can check those out. And I'm Scott Peterson. I'm the sounds that you'll hear later after we finish our discussion. And this whole thing was going to be possible by a grant from the Toronto Arts Council, so we want to... Big up the Toronto Arts Council. You guys already paid for this, that's why it's free. Thank you for coming. Mm -hmm. We should get back to it. Yes, yes, they can. can. I mean, one of the things that I find fascinating is that art is, for example, a very hierarchical creation. And um, so, I mean, just as an aside, that, you know, it's not just corporations that, you know, um, create things like an art company, uh, you know, I mean, you know, films have directors, <laughs> and I need them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, basically you discover if you really want something to get done, you have to do it yourself. I mean, that's like the lesson of life. I mean, other people may be going on at a certain point to generate enough enthusiasm and capacity. Uh, the photo showed how small groups can work together well. I mean, 13 days, they accomplished a lot, I think. But what lessons do you think we can learn in, in cities from uh, the experience that you had there? I mean, is there anything that could be practically applied to our life in the city beyond what we see with neighborhood councils, which is a start, I guess? So I'm just wondering, um, is there anything from the film and that experience that we could learn from in our life with people in the thousands, millions as we live together in Toronto. Uh, oh my God. <laughs> I know it's. I hope so. I mean, I hope so. No, but I'm just trying. Like, what practically? What pra well, I mean, I think that you know, I, I, Daniel and I were speaking before that you know one of the current phrases you know that Al Gore used when he was here was you know it's it's not there's no there's no you know silver bullet it's silver buckshot so there's so much to be done that I, I think that you know the, the glorious thing is that you know it's an opportunity and I think maybe you said something like this in your book too that there's an opportunity to find out you know what are you good at what do you enjoy what feeds you what 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 really uh, nourishes your passion in life, and, and you know that it's taking us to where we want to go, and go out and do that, and at the same time, you know, working on your own self awareness, and uh, you know, kind of creating whatever this sort of um, you know mental slash spiritual you know meta life uh, you know of humanity that you're contributing to is also I think maybe part of it. So. Uh, you know, I think it's all of us doing what we, doing what, you know, like whether it's, you know, elections or, or council or not, you know, not making garbage, not, you know, all those things. I don't want your sidewalks. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's so many things to do. So I want to be like conscious of our time here, um, which is probably not the internet. And I thought like maybe I would explain to most people who are going to be familiar with my work and how I end up on the stage. Uh, so as, as briefly as I can, it's going to take a few minutes to my answer, and that will also sort of open up the subject of 2012, uh, hopefully, and then we can maybe move into a discussion around that all day. Um, unless I have an urgent question, I can't wait. Okay. Um, so I already gave the, the longer version of the same spiel uh, last night, so I apologize for the whole more here for that again. Uh, anyway, basically, um, I'm from New York City. I was a journalist, um, a writer in my late 20s. 
I sort of had a massive spiritual crisis in this kind of materialistic, kind of secular framework. And at that point, I went back to my life up to that point, and I tried to figure out, you know, had there ever been anything that I'd been exposed to that was like another access to a different form of consciousness or higher awareness or something. And the, the main thing that I remembered from when I was younger was the psychedelic experiences that I had in college, just a handful of experiences with mushrooms and LSD. And, um, you know, I, I really, as I discussed again last night, but I remember that my first mushroom experience was very distinctly as having this capacity of kind of social deconditioning. Like, normally we kind of are so used to the world that we live in, uh, you know, especially for, you know, in this urban world, that we kind of forget that all these things surrounding us are actually kind of um, social constructs. They're kind of like thoughts that somebody had and then became like, a kind of structure, you know. So I remember on this first mushroom trip going to a deli and using money to buy something and just being absolutely astonished that these like dirty green brown pieces of paper were like the center of this whole society that I was in. Um, and also being astonished at like, you know, our, our architectural choices, you know, like why white angles, you know, why are we always in squares and cubes, you know, why are we always in grids, you know. Um, you know, and, and um, you know, why these, these little automobiles or one or two people are kind of clustered together. So, um, you know, so when I was in my late 20s, I went through this spiritual crisis, I decided um, that I would use the tools of journalism, which I then had to go back and more systematically explore psychedelics. And I began to get some assignments to visit different uh, tribal groups around the world. Because um, although psychedelics are kind of outlawed and, and forbidden and suppressed in the West, they're actually the sacred fulcrum of a lot of indigenous cultures around the world. So I went to West Africa, and I went through a tribal initiation in, in Gabon, uh, taking a substance called Iboga. Uh, I did that for a music magazine called Vibe. And part of the reason I mean, that assignment is Iboga was also being used, and still being used as a, a treatment, experimental treatment for addictions, for heroin and cocaine addiction. And um, my own experience with Iboga was like a very long, psychoanalytic kind of uh, experience with what seemed to be some kind of spiritual entity guiding it, who kind of brought me back through early life experiences, childhood experiences, um, gave me a little hints about the future, and ultimately gave me a sense of tremendous kind of uh, liberation and possibility. In the sense that even though I've been constructed based on circumstances in this way, having now understood all the circumstances you know, like my, and I went back to my parents getting divorced when I was young, and, and illnesses, they had a large, long, long term illness I had as a child. Having gone back to these sort of emotional memories, I could then, um, you know, redirect the energy of my future life. It was like I could recapitulate who I was and, and, then, and then use my will in a different way. So then I went also down to the Amazon and took a substance called ayahuasca uh, with a tribe in Ecuador called Sequoia. Um, how many people here have heard about ayahuasca? Okay, so, um, ayahuasca is a um, sacred visionary medicine that's used in the Amazon basin. It's brewed of two plants, the ayahuasca vine, the ayahuasca capi, and uh, the leaves of another plant, usually Secretary of Ritus. And the, uh, they, the plants have an unusual chemical combination together. The, the leaves of the plant contain uh, dimethyltryptamine or DMT, which is a incredibly powerful psychoactive substance that's also in our neurochemistry, it's in our brains and our spinal cords. And uh, but but our, but it's recognized automatically in our stomachs. If we try to eat it normally it's immediately neutralized with the stomach. But if you take it with the ayahuasca vine, ayahuasca vine contains MAO inhibitors which allow the DMT to be orally active. So somehow these indigenous people figured out this incredibly convoluted jungle chemistry out of these millions of plants in the forest. And if you ask them how did they figure this out, they would say that the plants told them how to do it. The ayahuasca line came to them in their dreams and said, you know, I want to try out this particular plant. Um, so I had that experience. Then, then I continued, I and mean, I just got really more and more fascinated. And also I began to have these kind of um, episodes in these experiences that were kind of psychic, uh, synchronistic. You know, these shamans would tell me things that would later come true, or they would seem to have privileged knowledge of my life up to that point. So my first book, Breaking Open the Head, ended up kind of chronicling my, my change in my own belief system. You know, whereas I started as a kind of um, secular materialist, 
coming from kind of Newtonian, Freudian paradigm, I ended up accepting that there was a kind of shenanic uh, reality, that there were these kind of other dimensions of consciousness, and there were kind of psychic and occult levels of, of, of reality that our modern Western society had completely kind of nulled and, and ignored. And um, so the questions of this book became, um, you know, why, like, first of all, you know, why, why did we do this? Like, why, you know, did we, did we kind of um, go out against uh, the traditional knowledge system? I mean, starting with the medieval witch hunt. So basically in Europe, we sought out all the people who possessed second sight and visionary knowledge, and also knowledge of working with plant teachers for visionary plants, and we ex them out or exiled them to, to the outskirts of the, of the culture. And then as we went on our whole colonialist journey, whenever we went to a, a culture that possessed a traditional knowledge system, we would specifically go after the holders of the knowledge system. We would you know, annihilate the shamanic traditions, burn the books of the Aztecs. So, and, and then you know, after this, in the 20th century, you know, we rediscovered the psychedelic compounds in, in, the, in the 40s and 50s. There was this upsurge in the 60s, and then this tremendous uh, repression exerted upon the substances, uh, ridicule, and all these different types of repression, legal repression, and also kind of ridicule. So there's no even way you could like, discuss them in, in normal company anymore. And um, so it began to seem to me that basically we had become like, possessed and obsessed by one form of awareness, which was this kind of materialistic, uh, quantifiable, uh, kind of uh, empirical, rational consciousness. And we had totally X'd out and suppressed this other form of awareness, which was this uh, intuitive and mystical uh, knowledge system that indigenous people have, and also in the East that they have to conform a bit with you know, the, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and the Hindu tradition and so on. So, um, so that was really the trajectory of the, of the first book, was kind of piecing back together um, this lost knowledge system for myself and doing it both with looking at different thinkers and philosophers and, and writers. And then also having my own personal experiences, which supported this kind of shift in perspective, and also taking a lot of anecdotal evidence from a lot of people. So it was really trying to be, and I felt this thing, this, this sort of journey that I've gone has been very like, logical from my perspective, like very, very straightforward. Uh, so that led me to the second book, 2012. So basically, if I had determined for myself that you know the Western knowledge system had, was fragmented, and we had sort of totally ignore and our best to kind of annihilate and suppress a whole other knowledge system that also had validity, um, then what did that mean for our future? What did it mean for our present and our future? And uh, it meant, for me, it meant that I had to take much more seriously what these indigenous and traditional cultures have to say about the world that we're in now. And then I began to collect information that there was a lot of um, foreknowledge in indigenous cultures uh, about this time being this kind of transformation time or, or, or critical point. And um, I you know, looked at a bunch of them. The, the cultures that I guess became most, the, the, the most focused of the book were the uh, Hopi, uh, who were the oldest original people in North America and in Arizona. And they talk about, they have a whole bunch of oral prophecies from centuries back, and they talk about this being the transition from the fourth world to the fifth world. And they say there's a whole bunch of stuff that they've already seen that was predicted, and there's just a couple more little things which are supposed to happen. Who were these people? The Hopi Indians, built in Arizona, the, the, sort of, um, the surrounded by the Navajo Reservation. Uh, but then there are other indigenous groups that have variations on, the, on these kind of foretellings. Uh, but they're kind of interesting because they're supposed to be the original dwellers on, on the continent. Um, and so that also got very interested in the classical Maya culture. And I, I, I would see the classical Maya civilization, which kind of rose up until the 9th century AD, and then fairly mysteriously disappeared. Uh, I mean, despite attempts to explain it, um, I think it's actually quite mysterious that it, that it collapsed so suddenly and completely in all these different city-states around the Yucatan. Um, but uh, so that, that civilization was the most sophisticated development of the indigenous knowledge system of Mesoamerica. And I, I correlate a little bit to Tibetan Buddhism. So if you think about Tibetan Buddhism, there was like a pre-existing tradition in Tibet, which was an indigenous genetic tradition, the Bon tradition. And then out of that, this much more sophisticated knowledge system began to evolve. That included you know, all these texts and termos and teachings and reincarnational lineages. You know, so, so we have these different lamas now and these reincarnations of these lamas that have told historical pattern. 
Um, so, so this classical line civilization, which was built on you know, previous civilizations in Olmec and Toltec, their kind of, uh, the, the one major focus of their civilization was kind of uh, time and, and um, sort of um, synchronicity. And the, the um, Mayan calendar, and they actually used a whole bunch of different calendars. They were huge astronomers and studied them very, very precisely the Venus cycle and the lunar cycle and all those other, all those other uh, galactic cycles. But their, their big focus seemed to be on this um, cycle that ends in the year uh, 2012, on December 21st, 2012, which is the end of a 5,200 year long count. It also ends in like bigger, even large, much larger cycles. And um, so, you know, in, in the book 2012, I, I both, as in the first book, I, it was both my experience, my, my sort of what happened to me as I investigated this stuff, and, and the kind of, and looking at different philosophers and thinkers and writers who give me context, or give us context for understanding it, including Western people like Heidegger and Carl Jung and Rudolf Steiner and so on. Um, so I end up with the, putting forward the thesis or, or the thought experiment in the book that there's legitimacy to this. You know, that, you know, we, we've inherited this concept that uh, indigenous cultures don't really have knowledge. You know, we have like knowledge that's real and scientific, and they have you know, superstition and myth and story and decoration. And that's even the way a lot of the archaeologists are looking at it. But I, I think that uh, it's much more um, um, likely that they were people like ourselves who had an interest in reality and had their own kind of science. And actually, they, they were just interested in profoundly different aspects of being and experiencing and codified it in a very different way. And they were in a kind of different state of mind, a different state of consciousness. So somehow they used a combination of a astronomical study uh, over you know, many centuries and a direct participatory visionary shamanism, including using you know, all sorts of vision plants, ayahuasca, peyote, and so on, to kind of um, look at the situation and establish that there was going to be this kind of uh, transformation in human consciousness. And it's actually very unclear from what we have like what, what they think you know, comes next. The same with the Hopi. Um, so the way I ended up sort of looking at 2012 or thinking about it is that we now, understanding this, it's really up to us. Like, like the, uh, you know, the, the ball is in our hands. And basically what we have now is a window of opportunity to um, have a huge evolution in human consciousness and shift to a much higher level uh, civilization. Uh, much higher level of being and knowing. And if we don't make full use of this opportunity, I think we're going to see a very quick uh, collapse and probably, you know, very likely even the end of the species in a couple of centuries. And um, I think that, um, I mean, that is justified. I mean, so, so, I mean, I went through the whole thing in one way yesterday, but the three main kind of um, huge trends that I see pointing towards this 2012 uh, thing. Um, is the ecological crisis. Um, you know, so we're at this point now where, according to a lot of scientists, within 25 years, within 30 years, 25% of all species are going to be extinct. 90% okay? um, of the oceans are currently fished out. And you know, as, um, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, people didn't even imagine that you could fish the ocean out of large fish. It seems so enormous. So it's, as our capabilities are increasing technically, we're hitting the limits of the biosphere in a, in a really harsh way. And you know, in terms of the species extinction crisis, you know, which includes like, the honeybees recently, and the frogs, and the amphibians, and, and all these kind of warning signals in, 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 in the system, you know, we don't really know what happens uh, you know, when we pass a certain point. There might be a threshold where we've, where we've tugged apart so much of the sort of web of Larger life forms, the whole that the whole system no longer supports large mammals. That we, you know, the planet becomes a microbial planet again. Um, you know, so so, so the so the ecological crisis, you know, and, and also the oil crisis and so on, uh, is, is I think pointing towards the absolute necessity of a, a massive shift in human consciousness and a um, you know different relationship to resources and, and to one another. Basically. Um, can you talk about the gnosis? What's that? The gnosis of a direct experience and how you can use it. Well, let me go through it in, in like a structured way. Because I've been really been trying to figure out how to 
you know, articulate this for people so that it's as clear as possible. So it's so like the, you know, ecological crisis, and the second piece is the technological evolution. And how, um, you know, we know that like, microprocessors getting faster and faster, we're getting more and more of these incredible gadgets all the time, everything's like shrinking and so on. So, um, there's different aspects of this technological evolution that I think are really important to understand. And one aspect of it is the way that it's uh, changing the nature of itself and the psyche. So if you think about like computer networks, social networks, um, uh, cell phones, blackberries, it's, it's, you know, if you look at like the 19th, early 20th century, you know, it took like a month for a letter to get anywhere. And, and we developed this concept of the self, which was very alienated and kind of this romantic existential separation, isolation of like, each of us from each other. And with all this technology, with all this new technology, it's actually like we're being meshed back together. And subliminal, I think, senses that um, we're no longer as as super, you know, alienated, individuated. We're actually becoming more subliminally aware of how we're constantly being con constructed and reconstructed by by kind of feedback loops, our networks of personal relationships, the media that we allow into our into our you know uh, world. You know, it's kind of like it's kind of, kind of constantly making us in a way. And the idea of there being this kind of hard and firm self is kind of melting away. The self is sort of becoming softer and more permeable. So there's that piece of it. And then, and then of course, I, mean, I guess one way I would say that I see technology is as a kind of a material manifestation of our psycho-spiritual evolution as a species. You know, so at the moment, you know, where we're at as a species is reflected by, you know, nuclear weapons, depleted uranium, daytime television, you know, there's a lot of unconsciousness and also a lot of what Young calls uh, shadow material. You know, so it's like because, um, you know, as individuals and as a collective, we haven't dealt with the, the shadow properly, we are projecting that through our technologies. And the technologies become more and more ferociously destructive as we get more technical capabilities. Um, so, I mean, one piece of the book that I wrote is really thinking about how do we sort of reorient our psyche around, around technology. Uh, and, you know, it does seem like there is, you know, the, the technology is going to be absolutely crucial and necessary to, to keep things, to put things back together, to keep things going, but it's going to have to be a different relationship to technology. I mean, if you look at, well, I mean, this gets to the central pieces of the whole book in a way, but, you know, like Francis Bacon, I mean, who founded the modern scientific method, you know, said we must torture nature until she reveals her secrets. You know, so the, so the whole um, kind of construct around the modern, modern scientific uh, mentality has been this kind of, uh, you know, dominator, destructive mode of taking apart uh, nature and even like torturing nature. You know, so so clearly that's not going to go forward. We have to we have to kind of move our psyches into a different relationship to nature, which would actually be represented in different technologies. You know, so things like biomimicry. I mean, I think some of the things that could help us that you know make you know, large scale shifts. Actually, Morgan wrote this wonderful piece, short piece for Reality Sandwich about microbes that eat pollution and garbage and excrete fuel as their, as their waste, you know. And there's stuff like that which is out there on the level of the microbial world that if we could actually intermesh with these kind of natural systems on a deeper level, um, we might really be able to get out of our, our jam or have the tools to kind of work in. So the technology piece is the second piece of environmental technology. And the third piece is this, this uh, shift or change in the nature of the psyche. Uh, and, and those first two are kind of statistically verifiable. Most people will agree that those things are happening. But this third one is much more about what, I, what I've found in my own life, and most of the people who I interact with seem to be finding in their lives, which is an upsurge in kind of a synchronicities, uh, manifestation, telepathic foretellings, dream hints that then lead to some, something in, in a legitimate reality. So, it's, so the sense that, um, that, that this domain of the psyche is becoming more tangible. Or it's like as if um, the, the, you know, yeah, it's almost the one, one way to think about it, it's like the, the boundary between the physical and the psychic is becoming in sort of degrees uh, subtler, you know, not as hard and firm, more kind of uh, permeable, and it's, it's becoming a different type of, of membrane. Um, so, so and, and that for me is one of the, the, the aspects of this thing which is really difficult to grasp, when you get it, it's like super positive and hopeful, because it, it really is that there seems to be some kind of potential for a transformation in, in the psyche. Um, and, uh, 
I mean, one way I discuss it in, in the book um, is if you look at like the Industrial Revolution uh, in the 18th century, up until that point, um, you know, people had seen lightning, but they had no idea that electricity could be used to a transformative energy for the planet. So once we figured that out in a century and a half, which is like absolutely nothing in evolutionary time, we transformed the whole surface of the earth and we made a whole industrial global civilization. That's pretty incredible work. We didn't do a perfect job, but we did a lot, right? So it, it may be that we're on the threshold of accessing a different type of energy for transformation. And I think that energy would be psychic energy. And, and what people are experiencing in terms of these synchronicities, a sense of um, you know, increasing intentionality, a sort of bleak manifestation, telepathy and so on, is, is pointing towards the possibility of using psychic energy for transformation on a really deep level. And in, in the end of the book, I, I visit the Hopi Indians in Arizona and go to the rain dances, but I also I mean, actually didn't see them make rain. But I talk about, uh, but I talk about uh, this Cambridge anthropologist who spent years with them. And he said that I mean, he was a Cambridge dude, so totally skeptical, rationalist. But he, in his book, he was like, look, I hate to admit this, you know, but sometimes I would go to these Hopi rain dances, and it would be like 120 degrees, clear blue sky, burning hot sun, you know, they would go, dance for 20 minutes, clouds would gather, and the rain would start to fall. So, you know, that, and, and that was, for me, that had a lot of resonance with experiences that I had in shamanism, I and mean, just seeing all sorts of manifestations that seem totally impossible. <coughs> so I, I, I accept that as something that happens, that the OP, given the right circumstances, you know, are, and the right mindset, and, and the right purity of attention, are able to change the local climactic factors through, in, through interaction with elemental forces. So I think that is a capacity in human psyche. You know, so, so how interesting that we're going into this devastating climate crisis, you know, where you know the, the, the change in the climate is accelerating. All these feedback loops have been, you know, unlocked now. You know, I mean, maybe only that it's in such a crisis that we would be forced to do the work to to access the latent powers of the psyche and really work together as, as a global collective to to learn how to utilize uh, this other level of transformative possibility. So I mean, that for me is like what's the, the positive uh, potential in 2012 is really a kind of um, total paradigm shift, reorientation, uh, acceptance of you know the, the other dimensions of consciousness, and um, that almost becoming like the focus or fulcrum of, of a futuristic civilization. Um, so I, mean, I cover tons of material in the 2012 book, from like, crop circles to alien abductions. Um, to the modern calendar material, and um, um, some of you may have questions that relate to that. But um, so, so, so in, in terms of the relationship to, to, to Alice's film, I think that um, um, yeah, I mean it's a, it's you know we, we do seem to be in this period of intense transformation, and um, it really requires incredible um, discernment and discrimination. And I, I sort of been hanging out a lot because now you went to speak in like West Coast New Age festivals and so on. There was that one last week, and the people before me were talking about 2012 with this couple in these like flowy robes, and they were like, "Oh, you know the you know the cost of, of expanding you know your consciousness is you have to lose your mind. You know it's all about the heart." And you know I got back and said that was totally not my perspective. Like I feel that we've never been in a position where we use our minds more. You know, but, but we have to if we have to use thought properly, and um, we have to really become much more discerning and discriminatory. So, you know, for instance, the 13 Moon people and the Mojo Zaragoza stuff, um, for me, like, I mean, I, I really, I got this in depth yesterday, but this whole idea that, that um, we have a kind of desynchronized relationship to time, that uh, we, have, we, live, we have a calendar <coughs> that has no relationship with natural patterns. Um, like the, moon, the months used to be moons, you know, so but now our months just follow kind of in an abstract, arbitrary way. And it was our well, a genius to point out that, you know, although we generally don't think of a calendar as being significant, but you could also see it as being a kind of a meta programming device for consciousness, that it actually sets up all these patterns in your life in the year, you know, when you pay taxes, when, when the new year starts, you know, which um, for some reason is in the icy regions of January. 
um, you know, all this other stuff, you know, when you go to school. You know, so, so calendars are kind of this metaprogramming device for society and for the consciousness of that society. So if you have a calendar that's totally off of natural patterns and synchronized, then everybody becomes increasingly alienated from nature. And actually, everyone needs to go crazy because without a, some kind of natural connection, they can't, they can't really hold it together. And so even if you go back like 5,100 years to the beginning of this mind long count, that was before that time, there were, there were more like tribal groups that were connected to the Great Mother, and they used the lunar calendar to follow the lunar cycle. So then there was this kind of switch over uh, to kind of a more hierarchical dominator cultures that worshipped the you know monotheistic father god and created an abstract solar calendar. And they took us off of this, the lunar calendar. So I, mean, I think that, that that stuff is fantastic. And our brothers were one of the first people to put that together. And then he channeled this damn 13 moon calendar, and it is kind of glamorous and sexy, and uh, you know, people do get into it. I've had some friends with it, but it, it's like um, you know, it's like an offshoot. And, and um, basically, like if you're gonna do something really important, if I'm gonna send my kids to school, you know, I'm not gonna send her to like the first school that we see. You know, if I'm gonna think about how to change my whole civilization's relationship with time, I'm not gonna grab the first like, channel instrument that somebody like puts out there. You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna want to think about it and weigh possibilities and, and sort of really think about what such a change could be and, and maybe get a whole group of people together to work it through. You know, so that's the kind of critique that I offer of the 13 moon calendar in my book. And, 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 I, and so I do think, like, so, so the, the, the idea of the 13 moon calendar, first of all, is that there's not, there's not really 13 moons in a year. And actually, a big problematic in ancient societies was uh, integrating uh, lunar and solar cycles. Like Stonehenge is actually a computer for integrating lunar and solar cycles. That's what it's, that's what it's meant to do. So you don't you don't go we, now we recognize from these artificial solar path power you know, cycles we can't leap back to the lunar because that would be leaping back from the rational and empirical fully into the intuitive, you know, from the masculine fully into the feminine. Whereas I think that what's called upon us to do is, is to now harmonize and integrate uh, intu intuition and rationality. And that's just, a, that's just a much more complex problematic, you know, and hopefully we're up to it, you know. I mean, um, my book is called um, The Return of Quetzal Quabal. The Quetzal Quabal is the feathered serpent, um, the bird snake of Mesoamerican uh, uh, myth. And so for me, Quetzal Quabal represents the integration of the bird and the snake, which is the air and the earth, heaven and earth, spirit and matter, or it could be the integration of the um, intuitive, shamanic, mystical, traditional kind of feminine uh, way of understanding and realizing reality with the rational, modernist, you know, empirical, scientific way of being. And I think it's as we bring those two things together that we create this next level of consciousness that actually is what 2012 could be. So that's, um, I guess, like a brief overview. You didn't answer that first question during Moses. What, uh, you mentioned gnosis. What, he, okay, what was the question? Gnosis is the formulation of experience, <coughs> like you're always going to get a bunch of psychedelics and trip to use and then had a direct effect on you. Like you obviously went to other people, but you took upon yourself the power of direct experience through psychedelics and psychedelics. What's the question? Um, gnosis and, and the process of needing. But, but ask the question. The need for people to discover on their own. Yes, I mean, I mean, I mean um, for some people, it's necessary to discover on their own. Uh, I don't think that the direct shamanic path is for everyone. I think that was kind of a mistake. I mean, I, I think that was almost a mistake in the 60s. Because you know, if you look at tribal and shamanic cultures, um, it's not everybody. It's like one out of 15 or 20 people is called upon to go through a whole initiatory process. So I, I think that number is probably universal. You know, um, so so um, you know, maybe everybody wants to get a little taste of it. Someone wants to become their cultural value. But um, yeah, for me, in a way, like the, both books have been um, my attempts to, you know, bring down these kind of incredible experiences you have in psychedelic states, and and, and mesh that with with this normal consciousness that we're in, and it's like a really difficult thing to do. I mean, it has been. So, how would your vision of a massive shift of consciousness differ from the Buddhist take on enlightenment? Would it be any different? 
Uh, well, I mean, there's this guy, Carl Johan Kalman, who's written a, he, he really looked at, um, he came with sort of mathematical modeling of my calendar, and he thinks that we go into enlightenment becomes necessity, like that's where people are at, starting in October 28, 2011. I think it's, that's a little silly. What, we just shift into enlightenment? Well, pretty much, I guess, <laughs> one, one possibility is a kind of morphogenic field effect. I mean, you know, so it's funny that's happening now is like, um, a lot of people are exploring all these spiritual traditions. It's kind of like the good part of globalization, you know, so like, people are meditating more, doing yoga more, you know, doing shamanism, and, and deepening these practices. And, you know, there, there's a really, you can really feel a shift, you know, new age flightiness, like a really a much deeper level of engagement that's going on. So, you know, it might be, I mean, the Rupert Sheldrake, which is a scientist who talked about the 100th monkey principle, you know, that, and, which is apparently the actual uh, evidence for that is weak, but uh, in that case. But I think the principle is a really interesting one. That basically, you know, if a, if a certain percentage of a species learns a new skill, that becomes available in the kind of morphogenic field for the whole, for the whole species. So everybody can get a handle on that. And, and I think, what's that? I think, so I think there's some evidence for that in, in how we progress so fast and, and, and learn so much. So it might be that that kind of that attainment of a kind of non-dual awareness or kind of, um, you know, I, for me it's like recognition that the psychic and the physical are aspects of the same process. You know, that's what I think synchronicity is revealed. That there's actually like a total interconnectivity between mind and matter. You know, unlike the kind of separation perspective of, 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 the, modern, of the modern era. So, so, you know, I, I, think, I think it's going to take a while. You know, it may be that a critical threshold gets that idea that becomes more commonplace and then creating structures around that, systems around that. I don't know how exactly it will look. Five years? What's that? All of this in five years. Yeah, why not? I <laughs> think <laughs> <laughs> people are tired of this. You know, well, like you know, know S and D cells are still going up, though. What's that? There's a lot of people that are still asleep. I mean, S and D cells are continue to climb. Right, but, but when, astonishing once, once, once awakenings take place, I think they can happen really fast. I mean, um, I, have a kind of, I kind of have a historical connection, because like my, my mother was involved with the Beats, and she was with Jack Kerouac when On the Road came out, and up until the point there was like 50 or 100 or 200 Beats around the country, nobody gave a hoot about them, and suddenly it was like time for that, you know, so, so suddenly that information went wide scale, and then by the early 60s you had Bob Dylan and the Beatles cult, I mean it's not an accident, that's the, you know, the Beatles um, from the Beats. You know, so they took those ideas, you know, this more uh, liberated approach to life, an experiential approach, and just zoomed it out. That it became it became ownership of millions of people. And we, we, we're seeing that in, in in Canada in the last year, uh, you know, environmental consciousness went from like issue number 27 I know, not to you know number one. You know, like I mean, like conservative politicians. Or many of us for years have been going when are they? Yeah, of course. This is of course. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, a, you know, just the wrinkle on sort of what what you're saying, Daniel. Uh, you know, it, from my perspective, is that um, I actually, uh, you know, I think that our whole view of that it sort of comes from the human psyche uh, comes from this um, sense that, you know, like there's a whole universe. And then there's this like little like ant on this little blue planet that is somehow outside of of it all. You know, is kind of a particular case with this little psyche that's got these little qualities to it. But I think probably in the new worldview, we're just going to see that you know our psyches are just part of the whole universal matrix and what we. The way that the sort of archetypes work within us have to do with the fact that that's just the way the universe this is. This is also a very and, old way of seeing. Things. Which is a very old way of seeing, and you know, but I think has a lot of kind of new um, kind of gas, you know, that that comes from a you know a kind of urgency. Yeah, like well, which possibly actually possibly comes from you know the. The fact that there is a qualitative nature to time, that it's not just a quantitative, um, you know, sort of somehow passage thing, but that, you know, every moment does have a quality that is shared universally, and that we, you know, so we're not having to generate this change in consciousness. This change in consciousness is generated 
we are, you know, by the larger reality that we're in. And we are, you know, those of us who feel, you know, called upon are able to begin to express this, you know, this, this new outlook which we are sort of enabled to have because we happen to be part of this moment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so that's just it. I mean, that's the next question. I just want to make one quick clarification. The mind calendar, the basic idea is that, like, we are in this, uh, you know, Newtonian Cartesian model of time. Uh, we're basically, like, going back you know, to the Greeks, really, we became obsessed with kind of space and matter and thought we could materialize everything. So the whole way that our culture thinks about time is we talk about time as if it's a spatialized quantity. So we talk about amounts of time, like, running out of time, having enough time, wasting time, spending time, time is money. So it's like we're constantly thinking about time as if it's like out in front of us somewhere. We can like get our hands about it. So around us. Then we're like chasing after it. So we build machines that kind of speed up all these processes and we're still like trying to get a hold of this time and it just keeps slipping through our grasp, right? So like, you know, why did the classical mind civilization never invent the wheel? When they were building all these complicated pyramids, if they had the wheel, they could have built them a lot faster, right? Well, they didn't want things to go faster, you know? They didn't, they didn't necessarily, they were more interested in the qualitative aspects of doing these kind of ritualized processes, you know, in the proper time, you know? Um, and, and their whole way of understanding time is as a kind of a qualitative loom of resonances. So each of the day of the 260 day count has a different, like, tonal signature. And then, the, and then these days have, like, relationships to each other. So it's a kind of, like, a harmonic composition, almost like a symphony or something. So then, so then you can begin to, you know, experience, you know, the time in this, in this qualitative uh, way. And is it based on astrology? Mm-hmm. Not exactly. The, the two, well, the 260-day count seems to be um, um, sort of embedded in different respects in the cosmos. Like, 260 days is the average length of the human gestation period. 260, the 13 by 20 Zulkin. And then we're 26,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way, which was a big part of their cosmology. And then we're also the procession of the equinoxes that the Egyptians were obsessed with. So that we're now going from like the age of Pisces to the age of Aquarius. Mm-hmm. That whole cycle is a 25,800 year cycle. So once again, almost 26,000 years. So it just seems that that 260 and factors of it are like deeply embedded in our whole situation. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I'm curious about what you think about this on a sort of a more global cultural idea. Like when you talk about more people are doing yoga, more people are meditating, it seems more like a, a Western problem. Like the West needs to come up to speed, where there's billions of people who are meditating, who are doing yoga, and they've been doing it for millennia. And Did you say millennia? Pardon? Well, I, I don't know. <laughs> that, actually, they, my dad's it was more like another elite little groups in those cultures would be accessing those kind of esoteric practices. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like Western scientific thought has been leading more into these cultures, and those cultures are abandoning those ideas. And, you know, right. so what do you think about this as much as a, a cultural shift as a psyche shift? <laughs> are you talking about the global culture who probably all think of psychic shifts in very different terms. Yeah, so I, mean, I would say, right, so basically, like, um, we had this, you know, kind of entry in Eastern thought over the last century, like, really gaining ground in the last 50 years, and, you know, it's not a trend anymore, it's a shift, you know, the, the, the deepening interest in, like, Tibetan Buddhism, yoga, you know, Eastern disciplines, that's not a trend, I mean, that's, like, a major underlying shift right. in, in the way, like, a lot of people are now, you know, being in their, in their world, in their reality. And so at the same time as we've had this entry of these Eastern concepts into the Western uh, psyche, we've been disseminating our Western paradigm across the globe. So basically what, what's happening in India and China right now is that we've hit them for the last 50 years with mediated propaganda about the American dream. That the only thing that's a good life is a material-based life. You have a new car and a, you know, a new house and, you know, and so on. So they finally picked up on that and we hit them with it for so long. And now they're all trying to live that dream. And we know that that's not possible because the planet is not going to sustain that at any level. So, I mean, one of my ideas about how we're going to make this shift is actually use like television. You know, basically, although the West and the U.S. especially, I guess, is kind of busted you know, in terms of its foreign policy and its, and its activities, somehow we're still kind of the uh, collective dream machinery for the planet. We're still projecting the, the dream that humanity is following. 
So it's going to be necessary for us to project a different dream across the planet. And that dream is going to be a much deeper, I think, you know, synthesis of Eastern and Western ideas. And, and, with, and, and it's going to have a, you know, less, a much less a non-materialist, uh, you know, actually kind of a deeper materialist focus. I mean, another little switch I really like is from Alan Watts. Talked about how, um, you know, we think about Western culture as being materialistic, but actually, in a way, we're not materialistic. And actually, indigenous cultures were far more materialistic. Because our whole thing is that we impose like, these abstract grids over reality. You know, like uh, these abstract streets or whatever. We don't really care about what's there. We just like, want to pave it over, you know, so we can do our abstract thing, you know. Whereas the indigenous cultures are deeply materialistic, and that they care about like this stone, this tree, you know, this, this plant. You know, so their connection to materiality is on a much deeper level. And, but, and, and it's within that connection to materiality that they also have the spiritual connection. There's not, there's not a duality there. That's an imposed, imposed duality that we think. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it's a hard question. Yeah. One thing that interests me, and, uh, if, if one looks at various uh, countervailing tendencies in Western thought, uh, just taking sort of a plunger at it, uh, and his, the, the school of plunger going through to in emphasis into Mandelbrot, you could say that the uh, the kind of uh, opening for the possibility of thinking about practical time that is represented by um, by chaos theory and by work on practice would be something that might stimulate uh, keen interest in some people who wanted to merge to uh, help the um, the blend between uh, culture like Tibetan Buddhism. So when you came up and there, Really wonderful handling of Thompson with um, the discussion of the member of Set uh, as a nice rejoinder to the Seti people about mm -hmm. that they're sending out five. Uh, perhaps you could um, further talk about that, but it seemed to be a very compelling argument and um, um, you know, could further ask the opponents. Yeah, I mean, uh, that was really well said, and definitely a lot of things that, um, like the scientific. Uh, developments which often surprise our scientists now correlate corresponds perfectly with like mystery traditions and mystery wisdom. You know, so quantum physics, you know, for like the Tao of physics and, and the self aware universe, like it totally fits perfectly with like Tibetan Buddhism or, or you know Rudolf Steiner's philosophy or something. So it's like being pushed further because when you pick up the Swami, yeah. you're getting someone who's uh, sort of militantly applying uh, his Hindu tradition to I know he's militant, but yeah, I know. Well, I mean, it's. I remember Swami is a quantum physicist. He wrote these two books, The Self Aware Universe and Physics of the Soul, that I discussed in my book. And basically, he's looking at how quantum physics could really provide a basis for forming scientific hypotheses of how you can have subtle bodies, chakra systems, how reincarnation could work. Um, and so on. And I think it's like really wonderful uh, work. Yeah. But in some sense, he's not uh, intellectually as impressive as someone like uh, Niels Bohr or David Bohm and so forth, but he's working clearly within the Indian tradition. So at this somewhat less exalted level of, uh, of thought in that philosophy, we're seeing these things that I think help with some of the other uh, concerns that people have. That is, uh, India and China are, are probably going to produce people like Goswami who mm -hmm. uh, take up different themes from their cultures that are yeah. counter to the um, Newtonian mm -hmm. part. But the things are great, like the, the, the newest, newest advanced scientific thinking, which is you know, kind of going in the very same direction, right? There's you know, much more to what is going on than what we see. 